Good morning, everyone. Welcome to CEDA's live stream on empowering First Nations people through community-led healthcare. My name is Cassandra Windsor, and I am Senior Economist at CEDA, the Committee for Economic Development of Australia. CEDA acknowledges that today and every day, we are on Aboriginal land. Committed to recognition and reconciliation, we respect elders and we support their state aspirations. Today, I'm coming to you from Perth, on the land of the Budrick people of the Noongar Nation, and I'd like to pay my respect to their elders, past, present, and emerging. There's little that is more important to the future of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders than improving healthcare outcomes. Closing the Gap has a target of closing the gap in life expectancy by 2031. And we are not on track to meet this. While there has been some improvement, there remains a gap of 8.6 years for male life expectancy and 7.8 years for female. We are not making progress quick enough and community-led healthcare is crucial to turning this around. I'm looking forward to hearing from today's panel of experts on this topic. Today's event is the fifth in a series of CEDA events on empowering First Nations people, with previous discussions held on employment, housing, schooling and tertiary education. So far, we've had over 1,700 people participate in the series of live streams, and we've welcomed the continued interest and support of CEDA members in these discussions. We encourage you to join today's conversation by following CEDA on Twitter at CEDA underscore news and tag any comments on today's discussion with the hashtag First Nation. And you can participate directly in today's discussion by asking questions using the Pigeonhole app. You can enter via the live stream page or log in via theta.pigeonhole.at with the password healthcare. On Pigeonhole, you can either enter your own questions or view and vote on the questions of others so that I know which ones are the most important to the audience. At the end of the event, we also ask you to pop into Pigeonhole and rate your experience. We have a great lineup of speakers for you today who will all give you a bit of a different perspective on today's topic of community-led healthcare. We have Selwyn Button, who's chair of the Lowitcher Institute and a partner in Indigenous Consulting at PwC. Adrian Carson, who is CEO for the Institute for Urban Indigenous Health. And Ian Wisher, CEO of the Fred Hollows Foundation. Each of our speakers today will make some brief opening comments um, and then we will move on to the panel discussion. So please start entering those questions in Pigeon Hole now to prepare for that. I'm now going to hand over to Selwyn, who's going to make some opening comments. Thanks, Selwyn. Thanks very much, Cassandra. And can I also start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that I'm uh, sitting on today that's in the middle of Brisbane or Mianjin. Um, it was known by its traditional name and they have the tra traditional grounds of the Jagger and the Turrbal people and I pay respects to their ancestors. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit today about um, my role as the chair of the Lowitzer Institute and the work that has happened within the Institute over the last uh, 20 odd years and, and certainly what we have been able to do um, over the last couple of years is transition from being what was previously a CRC, and originally it was the CRC for Aboriginal Health, now moving towards being the National Institute um, for Aboriginal Health and Health. So it's the only, essentially the only community controlled research institute uh, for Aboriginal Health and Health in the country. And what we've learned, certainly out of our approach um, being a CRC over the last 10 years and, and looking at the research that we've undertaken and the projects that we have funded is that what's happened in, in community is not just about the delivery of services. And the, the important factor that we bring from the Lower Tree Institute perspective is, is how do you ensure that we're building the capability of people in community, of clinicians, of Aboriginal health workers, of staff and others who are working in community-based organisations, in community control health service across the country, how do we expose them and build their capability to undertaking community-based research so that they can undertake real-life evaluations of the things that they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis to then give them the evidence and give them the knowledge and insights, not only about how well things are going in their own patch and what's happening in their local communities to improve outcomes, but what's then the translatable piece that comes from that that we can then share and publicise and then and then spread the word across the rest of the community control sector to ensure that those things are occurring um, on a more systemic basis. If I give you a quick snapshot of some of the work that we've done, um, certainly over the last 10 years, we've had about $26 million 
of research projects undertaken across across the country. Um, that equates to about 150 um, research activities. So these are these are community-based research activities. Many of them happening in community-controlled organisations. Of that number, um, of the 150, 70 percent of those research activities were actually led by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander researchers. So that's been a key focus for the Lawrence Institute is to build, not only to build the knowledge base, but also build the capability of Indigenous researchers to perform in this space. Um, so they're, they're the, they've been big activities to ensure that we can, can make a significant difference. Um, as I mentioned, it's when we, when we look at some of those researchers, a key component of our activity has also been about ensuring that we provide scholarships to increase, um, I guess, the increase those Indigenous um, researchers and scholars that wanting to wanting to maintain, I guess, a presence in a space in, in terms of undertaking Indigenous research. And we've had about 40 scholarships that we've provided to Indigenous researchers, both at a master's and a PhD level. And what we've done then essentially is build the knowledge base, build the capability um, and build the expectation that community-based research and research undertaken by uh, Indigenous researchers is a good thing and does lead to better outcomes. What that also has shown us through some of the outcomes coming through the research is that we need to have a significant focus on things like cultural safety. We need to have a significant focus on things like Indigenous-led methodologies and evaluations because they are central, not just about delivering the service, but then ensuring that it's we're preferencing indigenous knowledges in the way that we do business to get better outcomes. And when we do that, um, because indigenous knowledges do focus just not on the, the clinical aspect of it, but also on the translation and what it means in terms of overall community be benefit, we're getting a more well-rounded view and perspective on what outcomes can be achieved through the research work and the, and the activities that, that occur through the Lowestra Institute. Fantastic. Thanks, Selwyn. Um, lots of interesting stuff to um, get a bit deeper into there, I think, um, when, we, when we move on to our discussion. Um, Adrian, I'll pass over to you to make some opening comments now. Great. Thank, thanks, Cassandra. Um, I'm also in Brisbane, so I'll also uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of land upon which I've um, joined you today, the Yagar and Turbul people. Pay my respects to elders past and present. Um, I'm the CEO of the Institute for Indigenous Health. You've heard that as part of the intro, and I'll talk a little bit about what um, we've done in South East Queensland in terms of, I think, demonstrating the, the power of community control um, health services. Um, I think it's an organisation, our, our member organisations, there are four of them. Um, they've delivered care to our communities for uh, going on 50 years. So the first Aboriginal medical service in Queensland, Lakes Brisbane, established back in 1973, is one of the founding members of IUI, along with uh, Calvin, Health Service down the Gold Coast, Cambu, at Ipswich, and Yulibuiba on Stradbroke Island. So those four organisations coming together back in 2009 to take a, a different approach, recognising that the previous approach, um, as, as strong as the start was in creating organisations and establishing clinics and providing care to our communities in a very different environment to what we have now, closing the gap in national commitments. Back in 1973, there was none of that. And so our elders actually set these clinics up um, actually against government opposition and without funding. Um, our elders worked um, without any, any pay for many years to actually get these services up and running. So having those organisations um, established, then expand over time, the first Aboriginal Medical Service, Lakes Brisbane, and uh, working with other communities across South East Queensland to set up their own local health services, um, kind of served communities well for a period. But when we found ourselves in 2009 with national commitments to close the gap, $1.6 billion dollars, the commitment was towards achieving um, deliver, uh, to um, achieving health equity by 2031. Um, at that time, it was a, a government that had also made a comment that uh, they made no apology for mainstreaming healthcare to Indigenous people in urban areas. So it was very much uh, a focus. Community control, according to the government, then was very much about um, remote and regional communities. Uh, wasn't a solution for urban communities that we we call home. In fact, the largest proportion of Indigenous Australians reside in urban areas. So those organisations come in together <clears throat> to create the institute to actually adopt a very different approach. I think it's the best way to describe it is a is a network system approach. The four organisations coming together uh, to create a new entity uh, for that for that new entity, the institute to be the mechanism through which um, we don't just support and drive growth and community control health services. Um, increased resources coming into um, the clinics that we operated, but also really importantly to actually 
uh, work in and reach into the mainstream health system to actually get change happening in terms of how those services are delivered to our people as well. We're talking about universities in terms of how they teach the next generation of health professionals, but also uh, hospitals in terms of, for example, how they provide care to our mob. A particularly uh, good example um, is in relation to cataract surgery, just acknowledging the work that we've done previously with the Fred Hollows Foundation that funded really important work for us about eight years ago, which has kind of led now to having optometrists across all of our clinics. And um, I think one of the very few in the country with an Indigenous specific cataract, cataract pathway that works with private hospitals to actually get our mob seen in an integrated, coordinated way, but also to be seen quickly. Um, so those four organisations coming together, creating scale, um, the outcomes of which is seen, our clinic um, populations, uh, our patient populations increase from less than 8,000 to well over 40,000 now. Our clinics that we operate increasing from five up to 20 at the moment. Um, the staffing of those clinics and that broader network um, increasing from a couple of hundred up to well over now 1,500. So um, big growth that's occurred in a very, really a period of 12 years. And if you go back to what I'd said originally, um, the government at the time said that there wouldn't be community control in urban areas, yet somehow this has occurred and it has continued to grow despite changes of government at a Commonwealth and state level. And I think it does uh, demonstrate um, the true power of community control where, where organisations and communities are empowered and empower, empowering themselves to, um, to deliver on their commitment and their promise to their, to their people, um, addressing some of our own challenges, having the resolve to fix our own systems, to uh, correct our governance. Um, and to be really focused on not just the people that we serve today, but really importantly, the people that we can't reach at the moment. Um, so I think by way of intro, it's a, I think you is a good example of the power of community control. Community control is not just the South East Queensland concept, it's all over the country, but um, I'll speak today, um, particularly about the history of this part of the, the country, which is unique. And again, when I, we talk about, particularly at a national level in terms of coalition of peaks and national plates of gap agreements, they're fantastic. But um, if we've proved, if we've, if we've really kind of learned anything from the first 10 years of closing the gap, and Cassandra, you're right, we're not on track to close the gap by 2031. So therefore what we need is to some catch up. I think um, South East Queensland does demonstrate that when left to lead, uh, community control level services can achieve a transformational change with which the mainstream system has failed to deliver. And particularly as we, we haven't given up on delivering that commitment to 2031, that's eliminating health inequality for our people um, a year before the Olympics too. So these dates are kind of fast approaching, aren't they? It used to sound like a long time ago. They don't anymore. Less than less than 10 years. Thanks, Cassandra. I'll hand back to you. Thanks, Adrian. Um, some fantastic comments there. Um, um, just a reminder to the audience that you can now go into the Q&A in, in Pigeonhole um, and pop some questions in or vote on some questions that are there. We've got a couple coming through already, um, but really good time now to go and go and pop them in. Um, and get ready for the panel coming up in a minute. Um, Ian, I'll pass over to you now to make some of your opening comments. Thanks very much. Uh, let me also begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people, the traditional owners of the land uh, on which I'm speaking to you from uh, down here in Melbourne and pay my respects to the elders, both past and present. A little cool down here, a bit cooler than Queensland. Um, although. Uh, 20 degrees, I think it's I think it's cool in Queensland. So um, I want to begin by telling you a story uh, which comes from the biography of Fred Hollows. Uh, it was at the first meeting in Sydney in 1972 that Aboriginal leaders approached me and said, uh, we'd like to set up a medical service. The next Friday, there was another meeting. And this time, Aboriginal leaders were utterly convincing as to why this was needed. Aboriginal people were not welcome in doctor's surgeries. They got pushed to the back of the line in casualty wards and there was racism was endemic. It was agreed at the meeting, a medical service by and for Aboriginal people would be started. We opened the clinic 10 days later. We plundered the Prince of Wales Hospital for equipment, stethoscopes, scales and thermometers. And later when we realized the patients couldn't afford medicine, we backed a truck up to the pharmacy at the hospital, loaded it half full of about $10,000 worth of pharmaceuticals and drove away. Thus, the Redfern Medical Service, the first community controlled health service was born. And uh, Fred was there and he had unusual methods. But what I can say is that the principles on which he acted 
uh, the same principles that we apply today when as a non-Indigenous organisation working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander leaders and community controlled organisations. The first principle is that it is a fundamental right that Indigenous people have a right to self-determination in all matters that affect their lives. And in 2006, this was actually enshrined in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. Now, in 1972, Fred just believed this. You know, he, he didn't have the UN Declaration at that time. He, he just believed in self-determination, and we still do today. And choosing to have a health service operated, designed, managed for Indigenous community is a legitimate right. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people had the skills then, have the skills now to best meet the needs of the community. And the role of mainstream organisations uh, is not to get in the way and try to do health for uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, um, but to ally themselves with those community controlled organisations to do the job. So non-Indigenous organisations need to listen to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander leaders and find the best ways that they can support. Um, now, we also need to convince the government what they need to do to support Aboriginal community controlled organisations. Now, perhaps we wouldn't resort to stealing drugs and equipment today, uh, although sometimes we might feel like that, um, but certainly other persuasive techniques should be used by non-Indigenous organisations as allies to convince the government uh, that the necessary resources to meet need should be applied to the situation. Um, and we have various techniques that we use as the foundation to do that, uh, to try to exert pressure on the government to do what it should be doing. Um, so the foundation continues the work of Professor Fred Hollows. Um, we, uh, we now work in you know, 30 countries around the world. Uh, we help train uh, local doctors, nurses, uh, health workers, uh, all across the world uh, in uh, low resource settings. And in Australia, we seek to be a good ally to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people uh, because we continue to believe in the fundamental principles which I've mentioned. And as Fred once said, there, there must be active community involvement using the community's own structures in every aspect of disease control programs. He just believed in community-led care. And I think that belief has stood the test of time as referenced by my previous speakers. It's done an enormous amount of good in that period uh, over 50 years. Now in Fred's time, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people were 10 times more likely to be blind or vision impaired than other Australians. And that's reduced now to three times more likely. Uh, that's an improvement we're pleased about, but we can't really rest on our laurels. We must do better. And ultimately there should be no gap. And um, you know, closing the gap, as we know, we, we're all committed to, but progress has been patchy and sometimes resources have not been av available. Uh, perhaps I'll make some other comments about um, you know, just my observations of uh, community-led care. Uh, some of these are kind of personal observations, but it's clearly the right model and it is working and has worked. And if we trace the rise and development of the community controlled health sector from the 70s, we, we see it spread across Australia, across the regions. And the whole regional aspect to it is, I think, very, very important, the way it works. Uh, Australia is a country of regions and um, it's an important part of the community control aspect. Uh, but there certainly are gaps in funding the need that exists and the access that's available. And this is especially true in eye health. Uh, often eye health is deprioritized over against, say, infectious diseases or non-communicable diseases or child and maternal health, uh, which are seen as more critical. It's not because people don't care about eyes, but it's just 
when resources are limited, you've got to prioritise. So I guess this is where the foundation still plays a role as an ally. We often identify the gaps, uh, either in treatment or pathways, and we provide supplementary funding. Often it's for a, it might be a liaison officer for a pathway to support people to access the system. It might be an eye health trained nurse in a remote community. It might be supplementary funding to ensure more surgeries get done in a public hospital. Now, at the same time we do this, uh, we are lobbying that the duty bearer for these things, which is the government, should be picking up their responsibility. So in some cases, uh, the government does come to the party. In some cases, the community controlled health organisation is able to absorb it. But once again, it's a funding challenge. Um, and advocacy is just as important, I guess, as you know, supplementary funding. Um, and a report was released recently that said that the incident of illness and disease remains high in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, and yet the funding does not meet that need still. So there's evidence, even as recently as this year, that funding levels are not what they should be. A final observation I'd make is that, and this is particularly true in remote communities, maybe not so true in urban communities, but when I visit community controlled health organisations, I'm still concerned how few of the medical staff, doctors, nurses and allied health are actually local people. And I think this is a, it's a this gap, but we train local people and we, we know how complicated it is to develop a local workforce and how many barriers there are for a, a remote community person to achieve, uh, you know, high school outcome, some kind of tertiary outcome and a medical skill and return to their community. So it's, it's a formidable challenge, but I think it is one of the next barriers that we, we need to solve uh, universally across the country. Um, so uh, I've certainly highlighted some areas for improvement, but overwhelmingly I'm the opinion that the community controlled health organisations have been the most important realignment in health services uh, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, um, you know, of the last century. Uh, what is needed is to build on success, strengthen the regions, interconnect the network, and above all, a fundamental respect for, from government for the role of community control. Uh, if Fred could have seen what community control health sector was today, he'd be bloody impressed <laughs> in Fred's kind of language. Uh, he always believed the skills and leadership and community spirit were there, but good allyship from non-Indigenous organisations and indeed the government is needed and not just needed, it's a matter of social justice. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ian. Um, some great comments there and, and plenty to unpack. Uh, we have got some comments starting to come through Pigeonhole, so that's fantastic, but please do um, keep jumping in and, and adding more there. Um, Going to start with a real easy one. Uh, not really. Um, and Adrian, I'll probably throw to you to start this one, but I'm keen for everyone's kind of thoughts on this. Um, given that we are, you know, we're less than 10 years away from, from these target dates for closing the gap, we're still so far from actually um, reaching them. We're making progress, but, you know, at the moment, not quickly enough. What do we need? Can we turn it around in time? And, and what are kind of the things we need to prioritise in terms of getting there? Is, is it funding? Um, is it particular programs? Is it, you know, what's the what's the key things that we need to do to actually meet these targets? Yeah, Cassandra, that's, uh, you said it was an easy one. It's, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I think there's there's definitely a capacity, right? I think um, the promise has been made and therefore there is no option. We must attempt to deliver on the promise. Um, I think if we, we uh, remember what the, the commitment is, it's to... Um, closing the gap in life expectancy by 2031, which means that a, an Indigenous bub born in 2031 will live as long as a non-Indigenous bub born in that year. Um, and so when you think about that, you, you do recognise also that there's a million different priorities. I think the importance of 
um, good investment in child maternal health and mums and bubs service. And in addition to everything else, you can't just do one thing, but here's a good example. So so when people wring their hands, and I you watch a fair bit of this, particularly when closing the gap reports and everything else, that um, yeah, it requires generational change. No, it doesn't. Like we've got programs in South East Queensland, birthing in our communities is a really good one. Um, Cell spoke about the importance of having our know, research and an evidence base. There was a research project that underpinned that um, particular service from the inception, an NHMRC grant. Um, the, the outcomes of that program was published in the Lancet um, back in March last year, so quite an internationally renowned uh, research journal. And what that program um, had produced is a, a effectively a close in the gap of the preterm birth rates of Indigenous bubs born through that program, to the extent that the outcomes from Indigenous bubs were actually better than the average for non-Indigenous bubs. That occurred within a space of um, five years. But when you think about the impact, right, um, the gestation period for, for a bub, but these impacts, these returns can be significant and can be short-term. So the importance of actually getting this kind of evidence um, out, um, ensuring that what, the, what we start to do as a system is focused on the things that work. <clears throat> I think I do... I think there is a bit of a tendency to focus, and I think the danger is that a, you've got an economy that's driven by how bad things are, that that's where the money goes. So it's almost like the system continues to produce the kind of deficits in order to attract the funding. I think there does need to be a very urgent reversal of that. And um, as Ian has said, you know, the importance of community control, and again, the evidence of around community control um, really should be where, um, yeah, that kind of the, the urgency needs to be deployed is to expanding those models that actually have, have an evidence space. If we can get bubs born, um, you know, full term, um, and which then produces significant ongoing outcomes, you know, the birth rates increase, all the rest of it, smoking, other things are addressed as part of good child maternal health care. We're actually birthing bubs, um, you know, out of the gap, like having what we have now and we accept you know, birth rates and preterm births as, as normal. It's not. So we can correct some of these trajectories very quickly if we can focus on supporting community control, um, the important role of mainstream partners with that bio-collaboration. It's the AICS Brisbane, it's IUE, but it's also the MARTA Hospital. So the midwives are actually employed by the MARTA. It's a really innovative model. People get a chance to have a good look at it. So having babies born through that program, actually addressing that in the way that that model works. It's not just about good Western kind of clinical care with midwives, although you know, continuity of midwifery care is outstanding. The midwife you see at home and in, in the clinic is the same midwife that births bub in the hospital. Um, also having family support workers, being able to actually address the real social determinants that impact on, on birth outcomes. And that could be issues around justice and child safety. It could be about household finance and um, even domestic violence. Having that ability to have those wraparound supports as part of the care model, I think, is what's produced the outcome. So, And if you look at that model again, another really important kind of compounding return is that when Indigenous communities are actually designing the service. You look at who's actually run that program, it's actually been run by Indigenous women. And the last three to four managers have actually been mums that actually birthed through BIOC. So all the family support workers now are actually former mums. So who best to design a service and run it than the mums themselves? So, and you can, you can apply that example to others, Cassandra, but there's, a, I think, a very um, clear evidence. It's undisputable. It's Lancet level kind of evidence. These outcomes can happen. You can apply that same kind of concept to a million other things. No doubt we'll get a chance to talk about now. Um, but there is this, what I, what I get frustrated about is we've just come, not out of the pandemic, we're now living, to, living with COVID, but we can see how things can move so quick, right, when we're, when we're worried about, you know, COVID and Delta and Omicron. Um, I think seeing that same kind of urgency deployed to actually delivering on the promise of 2031 would be something that I'd, I think we need to call out because there isn't this kind of the, the, the fierce urgency in now that the, the danger, I think what Martin Luther King used to talk about, you know, the, there is such things in history as being too late. You don't want that to apply to closing the gap. And again, as a country, you don't want it to apply to 2031, the year before, you know, this country will be on the world stage again, um, hosting the Olympics. I think there's a there's a plenty of evidence around the capacity of community control. I think we just needs to get, sometimes government needs to get out of the way and mainstream providers need to be challenged to also step back and allow communities to, to take control and, and lead to some of these fantastic models. Thanks, Adrian. Um, I think your comments about, yeah, showing how, you know, in a situation like COVID, how we can move really fast and, you know, some of the positives that came out of COVID were, were showing 
how quickly we can, you know, when you put the resources and you put the effort into something, we can see those changes. Um, so it'd be good to kind of, you know, keep keep some of that that um, momentum um, in some of those things and put that towards things such as such as closing the gap. So, when did you have any kind of comments on that? Where would you where do you think we kind of need to start? Um, or what's kind of the priority in terms of actually meeting these targets? And look, and just leading on from where um, Ian and Adrian were, it's the Lowitzer Institute was born out of necessity. Um, community control was born out of necessity and it was about community activating to make sure that we could put things in place to better meet the needs of our people. Um, and the Lowitzer Institute's no different, started the CRC and it's remiss of me not to recognise the two individuals who made a significant difference to create the Lowitzer Institute is Lowitzer O'Donoghue, who was the first chair, um, and Pat Anderson, who's been the chair for the last 20 years before um, I took it on. And, and they have put I guess their life's work into into creating the institute and the institute's actually about giving back to community and working in community and undertaking research and activities that ARC and HMRC didn't do but also highlighting to those other research bodies which is um, getting to coming to Adrian's point around now NHMRC funding things like BIOC in terms of a research capacity those things would not have occurred 20 years ago unless we had the Lower Tree Institute to highlight the necessity to focus on things like well-being within communities, focus on mums and bubs programs, focus on the need to look at partnering arrangements with, with major hospital facilities like the MARTA um, so that you can actually get these local things going on. And that's, and that's very much at the, at the core of, of the work that's gone on. And now what we see are things like cultural safety and what that looks like in, a, um, in, in terms of providing healthcare to individuals across the country as a, as a significant thing. It's embedded within university teaching. It's embedded within clinical practice. So those things have come out of research within the Lawrence Institutes that we need to then draw upon to work out, okay, well, if they are major issues and, and not only Indigenous researchers, but non-Indigenous researchers are finding these things as significant pieces of the puzzle to ensure that we can get better care how do we take those things and make sure they're embedded across the entire system, not just in the preventative space, not just in community control, but also in the major tertiary facilities as well. And, and there's been a lot of work that, that the Lawrence Institute's done over the last couple of years around racism in hospital institutions, not only just in Victoria, but certainly across, across the country. And, and it highlights then the, the things that we need to focus on, like cultural safety, um, that need to be more prominent in the work that happens to ensure that that continuity of care and the life journey of, of individuals that are transitioning through, um, through primary, secondary and tertiary providers, those things then become natural because we've started to address those significant barriers for them. And once we start to do that and embed those things in the system, um, we'll start to see some significant change. Thanks, Owen. Um, Ian, I'd like to come to you and kind of unpack um, some comments you made about workforce development. Um, and also picking up on Adrian's comments about, you know, the success of this kind of mums and bubs program, particularly when you had people from the community who who'd been through the same experience and then delivering the program. Um, so it does seem like you get some, you know, there's some real gains to be had by having more Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders actually in the healthcare workforce. What are you, um, are you seeing much progress in the space or what more can we do to, to really encourage more people into these sort of roles and working in their local communities? It's a big challenge. Um, we, we're very proud that we've got our first Aboriginal uh, Torres Strait Islander ophthalmologist, first one ever, so eye doctor, so Chris Raleigh Baker. Um, uh, we'd love to have more, uh, but you know it's a it's a long pathway to become an eye doctor. It's, it's like eight, twelve years of your life. Um, there's a lot more optometrists uh, coming through as allied health professionals, which is good. Um, nurses, it could be more. Uh, it's just it may be happening stronger in the regional uh, urban areas, but. Remote areas is really challenging. You know, people have to leave their community to do training often. We're questioning whether more training could be done online in supported remote areas. Um, don't have the solution, but it is uh, it is very challenging for people from remote areas to achieve these kind of goals. Um, so, yeah, uh, but I, I do think, you know, that the, the 
there's just a whole different level of care or understanding or empathy or connection when an Aboriginal person is able to be provided with a medical service from a, an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander person. I mean, it's just, and Adrian's example of, you know, helping design something, uh, having experienced it themselves, it's so powerful. So I'd like to see more of that. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I think um, definitely a space where we could we could see some progress and, and hopefully some really good outcomes. Um, so when you've taught you, so I think you said you've done kind of 150 research activities over the, the last few years. Where are you seeing the gaps in the research and, and where are your kind of current projects um, heading towards? What sort of what sort of things are you working on now or, or want to see more work on? But the, as I said, we, we started out necessity. So it's it's really about influencing the mainstream and what we need to do better and what we would like to see more of is what happens within a, 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 the NHMRC and ARC funding towards research dedicated not only towards Indigenous research projects and focus on things that are about improving outcomes in Indigenous communities, but it's the translation piece. What does it look like in terms of knowledge translation that's actually going to have an effect immediately as opposed to undertaking research for research sake so that researchers can then produce significant numbers of publications without having any impact within community. Because that's certainly been the, the attention and the focus of the Lowish Institute is we undertake research activities and we, when we fund projects that are about translation in local communities. And, and if we have a look at, I guess, what, what happens in terms of health research spend across the country at the moment, the work of the Lowish Institute equates to around 5% of indigenous health research spend um, across the country. So we're not the biggest in terms of the budget and the actual spend that goes on on activity across the country. NHMRC um, has the largest in relation to those sorts of things. But again, it's about how do we influence them to focus on not only supporting those things that are about translational pieces, but the other part of that is also looking at the notion of First Nations-led healthcare, then you actually better have First Nations-led res healthcare research at the same time to improve those outcomes. And so not just by funding more activity, but also funding those research activities that are actually led by First Nations researchers will see a significant difference in a, in a shift in the landscape um, in the right direction about ensuring that we are getting the translation right in local communities. Thanks, Owen. Yeah, and I think that kind of, you know, we talked about kind of the actual healthcare, providing healthcare workforce development. Um, what you're saying is we really also need that that research and evaluation being done by local people um, in local communities as well. So really important piece there. Um, Adrian, I've got a question for you that's come through Pigeonhole. Um, and thinking about you, so you talked about the four member organisations kind of joining together and how this kind of created scale. Um, so the question is, uh, how important are economies of scale in delivery of healthcare? And is there anything to see? Yeah, I think I got the end of that, Cassandra. Um, yeah, economies of scale, they're critical um, to what we've achieved in South East Queensland. So you've got, I explained the 20 clinics that operate now across, across the region. Um, each of those clinics work to a consistent model of care. Um, you know, with a specific staffing structure and they're extremely lean. But on top of that sits the ability to be able to share costs around allo health services. So the IUA network deploys something like 80 full-time equivalent allo health services from optometry through to um, audiology, through to speech, paediatrics and adult. And the only way that could be achieved if, is through economies. Um, if you look at what we inherited when we first kicked off um, IUA, we had um, podiatry services that were uh, individual clinics for in that time, it was only five clinics, had uh, arrangements with private uh, podiatrists and the private podiatrists knew they couldn't make any money out of Medicare. So they were insisting on, on sessional rates, which were pretty pretty good pay um, and essentially meant that they were kind of clipping toenails, right? So a really expensive toenail clipping service, fundamentally. So when you're able then to look at economies and, and look at where, the, where, the, where we can unlock some funding streams that we haven't got before, um, you know, some really good Commonwealth outreach um, programs, there's also Medicare MBS, so we can start to get these streams working as one. Um, the economies mean that the cost of providing these services today is somewhat 50% of what it would cost us if every clinic went off and, and, and attempted to, to employ their own allied health staff. So the economy is fundamental to getting those services. I think dental is another good example. We went from something like um, four chairs across the region well up to now 21 chairs. Again, that was, that was through scale, being able to negotiate and 
go back to the system. I think a good example for committee control, Mob 2, is that we, yeah, we originally funded the, those dental services as one of the big produce for our communities and um, some to the tune of $4 million a year. So it was a big reinvestment of Medicare and other income that we were generating. We were self-funding that care. Then you're able to kind of look at how the healthcare system works, where the funding streams sit. Then you work out the state government's actually funded by the federal government to provide free public dental care for anyone with a concession card. You can go and knock on the door of Queensland Health and say, well, guess what? You mob owe us about half of what we're spending because well over half the clients accessing our clinics um, had concession cards and were therefore eligible for free um, public care through the public health system. So then Queensland Health, Queensland government then starts to deploy resource and unlock that and provide it to us, which means we can then shift some of that capacity to address some other um, unmet needs. So I think it's all about economies and efficiencies, whilst recognising the importance of the autonomy of local community controlled organisations and their relationship with their with their communities. Um, in 2022, I think, and this is South East Queensland, I think I'd imagine it's even 10 times more important in remote communities. Um, economies and efficiencies um, enable you to construct services in a very different way. And um, you look at what happens now in South East Queensland, you walk into any one of our clinics, you can access the full range of paediatric and allied health, uh, sorry, paediatric and adult allied health services, comprehensive range of specialists, there's dental services, there's mental health services. Uh, we've got surgical pathways for ENT and all these other things now uh, that's only been possible through um, sharing the costs and getting the economies um, which means also that we're viable, we're sustainable, not just constructed something that's fallen over within 12 months. It's now sustained us for going on uh, 12 years. So really important. And my my experience is I don't think uh, I don't think we as a community controlled sector necessarily take up those opportunities enough. I think we're um, and hence it's the South East Queensland having the luxury of an IUI, a, a regionally a constituted organisation with that as a core function uh, means that our members enjoy significant benefits. It would be very hard for those four, in, four individual uh, organisations to achieve economies without that kind of single organisation bringing those um, opportunities to reality. Thanks, Adrian. Um, some pretty powerful examples there. And I think, you know, saying that economies of scale, kind of reducing the cost of allied health services by nearly 50% um, is a pretty... Um, pretty big one. And I think you also um, really highlighted some of the complexities of, of navigating these health and funding systems as well when you've got, you know, organisations like yourself and, and the private organisations, state government, federal government, um, really tricky uh, system to be to be working in, but really important to try to to understand it and, and to make sure you're getting the best outcomes and, and ensuring the kind of financial stability for your organisations. Um, and I'm going to throw to you with a question um, again from from Pigeonhole, um, which is about how can we really uh, facilitate better listening and knowledge sharing between Indigenous communities um, and non-Indigenous um, organisations? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think for non-Indigenous organisations, it starts with some deep reflections on what role we're seeking to play and what level of respect we actually have for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities and organisations because, um, you know, a critique of some charities or not-for-profits, uh, non-Indigenous ones, is that they, they often get in the way of funding flows and try to monopolise them for, you know, their own financial gain. Uh, that they, um, you know, that they, like Canberra, they often think that they know best what a community needs and will design a service somewhere, maybe at head office, and then roll it out. So I, I think it's about having those relationships and um, and and sort of having applying what I call good development principles. So I recently had a conversation about, you know, should the Fred Hollows Foundation <clears throat> go directly to a community and have consultations? And I said, no, I don't think we should. You know, in, in regard to eye health matters or health matters, we should only go to the community with the community controlled health organisation as our partner. Uh, you know, the community have chosen or elected or 
you know, that body to represent them on matters of health and to supplant their uh, role in the community by direct negotiations is just not, it's not good development and it's not, it's a fundamental kind of breach of respect. So it's, it's, yeah, it's just about really reflecting on practice, I think, um, really carefully uh, and, and thoughtfully to, to sort of understand what is motivating us and are we applying the right principles. So within our organisation, we have a set of principles that we must follow. Uh, you know, one of those is, is you know, not, not chasing down resources which rightfully belong to community-controlled organisations. And so, yeah, I, that's probably what I can offer on this topic at, at this stage. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ian. Um, look, just a, a question kind of picking up on some of the themes that um, kind of heard through, through everyone a bit today. Um, you know, we're hearing a lot of the, uh, the decision making is, is happening at a national level, happening in Canberra, but the success is, is really based on, on what's happening at the local level. So how do we, you know, we need these, we've got these big agreements like closing the gap, we've got the big funding agreements. How do we do that translation piece and how do we make sure that those, those local voices and those important local conditions are being taken into account when we, when we make big national decisions? Um, I might start with Adrian, but kind of keen for, keen for anyone to jump in here as well. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Cassandra. I think um, probably a nice kind of synergy with the conversation around um, you know, the kind of regional focus with um, commitments around the voice because that's all consistently kind of lined up around the importance of local voices and regional voices being recognised and kind of supported to be organised um, to underpin really what happens nationally. So I think where you've got, um, in, in the health space anyway, you've got IUI, you've got these organisations that have operated for um, going on 50 years, not as we're, we're the third Aboriginal medical service compared to Redfern, Redfern being the first, FARS then, then Brisbane. I think these organisations have made a decision to constitute themselves in a certain way and that um, that structure should be recognised by, by government um, and, and by everyone, including Coalition of Peaks. Um, and I don't think we necessarily see that kind of level of engagement. I think we kind of tend to rely on kind of the more traditional jurisdictional type, type arrangements or particularly in terms of the national level, everything. The last couple of years really has been a uh, coalition of peaks with I've not heard of any conversations connected here in terms of what happens in South East Queensland. So I think um, opportunity with commitments around the voice and particularly around the focus on regional voices, I think the recognition um, that structures do exist and therefore how does government directly engage those, um, and particularly if you're operating at a level which, you know, in health is at a system level, which is where we've attempted to be for some time. I think that does require then... Um, engagement from Canberra. Canberra might have to come to Brisbane rather than us suppose going to Canberra. You know, I think that's been the, you know, we don't live in Canberra. Some mob do. We, you know, our mob in South East Queensland don't, but for whatever reason, vast majority of the focus is on discussions in Canberra with people that don't live here. So, Cassandra, if that makes any sense, I'd be really keen to ensure that structures like these and, and others that exist around the country are empowered and recognised and possibly part of the reset and the acceleration of the transformational change that we, we need uh, in order to get uh, close to delivering on the commitment of 2031. Yeah, fantastic. So when have you got any anything additional to add there? Yeah, look, certainly the Uluru statement provides a roadmap around engaging with local and regional voice. And that was the actual intent of it, to look at that representative voice, not only at a national level, but local and regional level, to ensure that local and local and regional voices were heard and were part of the process around making decisions that affect uh, people's lives in local communities. And, and that certainly has been um, the remit and, and the way that I guess the Lower Institute's operated in our work as well. Um, we don't sit in our, our head offices in Melbourne, but we certainly don't sit as a board in Melbourne to then make decisions around research priorities for Indigenous people across the country. Um, what we do is we go out and engage and we set up governance structures and arrangements across states and across jurisdictions and in local areas to then engage with, in a conversation with with community control organisations and, and researchers to then help work with them to determine what are the health priorities activity that we should be funding around research. Um, and we use those mechanisms to engage to determine then what are um, the, the priorities across the country. It's not, 
it's not the other way around. It's not done from Melbourne. It's certainly going out and having those conversations to determine where we should be going and what are the things we should be focusing on. Fantastic. Um, Ian, did you have anything to add there? Just a couple of things. Um, I think if we, we've been talking about the 50 years of Aboriginal community controlled organisations from 1972, at least in the medical field. Uh, I think if we step back from that, you know, we're talking about an overall process of going from disempowerment to empowering oneself to seizing self-determination and really what I call building the fabric of self-determination. And, you know, it's an unfinished work at this stage, but it's a great piece of work that we can see already. And I would like Adrian and Selwyn re refer to the Uluru Statement from the Heart, and here I'm speaking as a non-Indigenous organisation appealing to other non-Indigenous organisations and saying, you know, the moment of history is upon us in the next two years to be good allies, to step up and voice our support for uh, Uluru Statement from the Heart, particularly, uh, you know, starting with voice, um, not to have things diluted, because this, this will be another piece of the fabric of uh, self-determination that is necessary. If you think of all the policy changes and the interventions and the funding flows, you know, we need that voice in Parliament um, to avoid the kind of wild kind of flip-flopping around and kind of disempowering kind of actions that are taken to modulate that out so that some of these recommendations that are coming up from, you know, regional groups and so forth filter through to Canberra and you start to get, you know, a much better approach to uh, all of this stuff. So I appeal to any of the non-Indigenous organisations out there, you know, get on board, get informed and, you know, step up because the moment is upon the country and will be a much better country as a result. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. An important call to action, I think, for everyone out there on that. Um, look, we're, we're running close to time, so I've got one final question, which I'm going to ask each of you. Um, and it said, you know, we've got a pretty pretty new government in Canberra. Um, if you had one, um, one thing for them to prioritise um, in uh, respect to community-led healthcare, what would that be? So I'll start with Ian and then I'll go to each of you to give me a kind of, as your last closing <laughs> thought, what's the, what's the number one thing you'd like, like the new government to do in this space? <laughs> That's a really complicated question. Um, <laughs> Just leaving, leaving, starting and ending with easy ones. Right? Uh, I have seen the power of regional responses. Uh, recently, I had a small part to do with establishing a eye health hospital in Broome, um, whereas previously the Western Australian government would pay millions of dollars to fly people to Perth to have their cataracts done. Um, and, you know, then they'd have to wait four weeks so they couldn't fly back because of the surgery and enormous expense quite wasteful but when you put investments into regions and you make the pathways great for aboriginal Torres Strait Island people you can see immediate improvements and I think you know Adrian and Selwyn have spoken of there are great examples out there of what works and uh, so you should back them in and I think that would make a huge difference thanks Fantastic. Thanks, Ian. Selwyn, what's your number one priority for the new government? Look, in, in addition to the Uluru State that they're really committed to, um, my advice would be is, is about connecting with those local and regional voices and, and giving rise to them um, and acknowledging that there are people in local communities who often do not get a voice. And, and what we've got to be able to do is to flip it on its, flip it on its head to listen to the voices of the vulnerable to determine what's required in local communities. And that would be my ask is how do how does the new government reach out to ensure that those local and regional voices who are often not heard in the conversation are now given a voice to ensure that we can work out what's best for their needs. Thanks, Selwyn. And Adrian, you've got the final word today. 
Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Cassandra. I've got the final one. I'm going to say there's, there's two things I'd ask. One is the pick up with Selwyn left off. I think um, for me, there's people that talk stuff, then there's people that do stuff. I think this government needs to spend more time with those that actually do rather than talk. So therefore, you need to get out on the ground um, and to recognise structures that do exist um, outside of Canberra. I think the, the second one would be, and Ian mentioned it, um, the importance of community development. I think what we've done with the Close the Gap kind of response well over a decade now has been to pump a whole heap of money to service delivery. And what we haven't recognised is that communities are communities and what we need to balance investment and service delivery is with community development. And so if all we do is um, people don't live in health services, people live in communities. So what do we do to invest in communities and communities' ability to be able to, um, you know, build their resolve to address their own issues and circumstance to, strength, to strengthen communities. Uh, there isn't too many funding streams for that. It's amazing how many funding streams there are for, for example, child protection, juvenile justice, healthcare and everything else, but there isn't any funding streams for community development to support communities to be stronger communities and to provide that as a fundamental basis for um, any attempt to improve um, health and wellbeing in the longer term. So I think it's balancing that investment from kind of just service delivery to also one in investing in communities. Local community leadership, I think, is a bit of a, it's kind of coincided, hasn't it, with the investment in service delivery. We've kind of seen the emergence of peak bodies and we don't see the same emergence necessarily of and recognition of regional leadership. So I think everything's kind of flipped on its head a bit. So if there's those two things, Cassandra, I'd ask the government to do is to, is to get out, do the work out, I yeah, don't accept what, what existed before nationally. Get out and ensure that those things have foundations. Get out to the regions and communities. And second, to balance your investment in building strong communities at the same time as responding in terms of service delivery needs. Thanks, Adrian. Um, and thank you to everyone today. I think um, really important discussion. Um, clearly lots for the new government to do, but also I think a role for all of us um, in providing support um, and really listening to and empowering communities um, about what they need. Um, and really kind of pushing th things forward so that we do make some progress um, and we can actually meet the this target by 2031. Um, we are out of time, so um, I'd really like to thank our panel um, today, so Selwyn Button, Adrian Carson um, and Ian Wishart. Thank you very much for your time and expertise. Um, thank you to everyone who has joined in um, and is listening as well. You're really vital to these discussions um, and a particularly big thank you to those that um, did uh, put some questions in Pigeonhole. Um, and please remember, um, while you're in Pigeonhole, you can also rate your experience today. So we'd really appreciate that feedback. Um, look, look out for the post-event email, um, which will come out shortly, and that will also have a link to the to today's discussion, so you can um, go back and, and re-watch any bits that you want. Please have a look at the CEDA website for upcoming events, so that's cedar.com.au, and you can register for anything on there. A um, couple of shout-outs, we've got on Wednesday the 29th of June, live stream on shaping our workforce of the future. Um, and also coming up not too distant future um, in the middle of August, we have our flagship national conference, which is State of the Nation. Um, so really, really important topics. Um, and particularly, again, given that we do have a new government um, in place, uh, time to be looking, um, you know, what, what are we going to see over the, the, the course of this government and, and what are the priorities? Um, so, yes, again, thank you very much. Um, and that is all for today. Thank you. <laughs>